many of these drugs are being shared with people they were not prescribed for, including a substantial number of people who have not received any formal diagnosis of ADHD. So more and more people, both with diagnoses and without diagnoses of ADHD, are getting stimulant medications. Pretty broad consensus, stimulants do work for people with ADHD. And there's actually a consensus that stimulants help for athletic performance for people in general. And we know they increase heart rate, they increase blood pressure. That's why stimulants are universally banned by almost every athletic organization. But the dogma that's sitting out there is that stimulants kind of effects for people without ADHD is minimal. Part of it's clearly designed as a message. If you don't really have ADHD, you don't belong taking these medications. But I think we are overreading the amount of data that comes to that, comes to those conclusions. And I'm going to jump into three different studies that were done in the last five years, all of which received fair amounts of attention in the popular press. And the message in the popular press, again, was strongly stimulants don't do anything good for people who don't have ADHD. I think, again, that's an overstatement. A foundational study done in 1908, so as I tell my children, that was way before I was born, and it's called the Yerkes dodson inverted U for arousal versus performance. They didn't actually map out this actual curve, but the curve is, if you're looking at arousal. If you're starting at someone who's asleep or barely awake or barely registering, performance is going to be poor. If you increase arousal, you increase performance, it goes up fairly steadily until you reach some plateau or optimal area of performance. And then within that sweet spot, if you keep increasing arousal, you're not getting much change in performance. But if you continue to increase arousal, then performance drops off. So again, that curve is up level and then drops down. So again, an inverted U shape. And that means if there's too much stimulation, you get too hyperactive, you get too distracted, you go off track, you don't perform as well. So that's a well-known phenomena. And when I started working with individuals with ADHD, adults with ADHD about 30 years ago, that was sort of the core explanation for why do stimulants even help people with ADHD when they make everyone else too revved up and jittery. And the claim was both groups of people are showing a similar inverted use shape for arousal or performance. It's just that people with ADHD have their curve shifted, as we say, to the right. So someone with ADHD needs a higher level of arousal to get to that same or get to an optimal level of performance. And someone without ADHD would be bouncing off the walls and already on the downward slope. Your D's Dodson inverted you makes its appearance pretty much in every Psych 101 textbook. And disclaimer, I never took Psych 101 or never even took an undergraduate psych course. Sort of universally accepted as a general truth, whether it's true in absolutely all conditions or what are the exceptions that occur or truth or variations of it. But let's just assume or take it as a useful rule of thumb or generalization that has some good validity. Even within the ADHD population, there is incredible individual variation in sensitivity to dosage. So I have one patient, 300 pound truck driver, five milligrams of Adderall, sometimes too much, maybe two and a half would be more optimal, but five was good. 10 was clearly too much for him. Clearly had ADHD, clearly benefited from it when he was on the Adderall. And I worked with sisters who were average in size and both clearly had ADHD, primarily inattentive ADHD, and one needed as much as 180 milligrams, one needed as much as 240 milligrams of Adderall, no signs of hyperactivity, high blood pressure, increased heart rate, no problems with it, but that's what they required to function. So even within ADHD, there's a broad range in sensitivity dosages. Three studies I'm going to talk about. The first one is just a Meta-analysis, it was done in 2020 by a group out of Liverpool. They looked at several hundred studies, looked at methylphenidate or Ritalin, studies that looked at dexamphetamine or dexedrine, and studies that looked at modafinil or provigil. Since so many studies look at different cognitive domains or realms, they chose eight different target cognitive realms to look at, how well people were at updating information, how well they were 
perform at switching tasks or cognitive mindsets to solve problems, how well they had control over inhibition, how well they accessed long-term memory, how well they performed on spatial working memory tasks, how good their memory recall was, and how good their selective attention was, and how good their sustained attention finding was that methylphenidate had weak overall effects on cognitive functions to improve it. These are in none on people without ADHD. Of those eight specific domains, methylphenidate only measurably helped improve performance in pre inhibitory control, recall, and sustaining attention. When they looked at modafinil, again, they could find a weak, tiny overall benefit in cognition from modafinil, but the only one of those eight domains that they found modafinil helped with was updating information. About a dozen studies looking at dextroamphetamine, and overall, they didn't find any overall cognitive benefit. They didn't find any benefit on any of those eight more specific breakout executive function tests. So their conclusion was these are substances that have significant, whether we call it high rate, but measurable rates of addiction, possible really bad side effects of psychosis, particularly with Adderall, potential for cardiac effect, potential for interfering with growth in children. Claim was that stimulants have such mild to minimal effects on boosting cognition in people without ADHD that pretty much you shouldn't be considering them. Then in 2018, there was a study out of Brown University that got a fair amount of attention in the popular press. And that study looked at only 13 people. They gave them all the same dose, 30 milligram dose of Adderall, starting about an hour and a half of dosing for about three and a half hours. So that was when levels should be peaking. Had not been done before was to simultaneously measure not just cognitive functions, which they use a battery of cognitive function tests, but they also measured autonomic function, physiologic, blood pressure, heart rate, and they measured subjective both mood effects and could you tell whether you're on a drug and did you like this drug effect? There was tiny effects on improving attention. There was a tiny, slight decrease in reaction time, errors of omission, and a slight decrease in the variability of responses. But there's also a slight but measurable decrease in ability to recall digit span. None of these were big, robust effects. On the other hand, effects on blood pressure increasing it. Effects on heart rate, effects on subjective experience. Yes, I'm on something, and yes, I really like taking it. Were substantial. The mood effect was actually the largest effect. People really liked it. And again, this study got lots of attention, and the conclusion was people are liking this. This is a big potential for addiction, and certainly affecting physiologic variables, and it has a minimal effect on cognitive performance. So. People shouldn't be using it because it's not having any real benefit and it's having lots of detrimental effects. Methodologically different tests just came out a few weeks ago. This was out of a group, Elizabeth Bowman's group in Melbourne, Australia, using either placebo or a 30 milligram dose of Ritalin or a 15 milligram dose of dextroamphetamine or a 200 milligram dose of modafinil. There were repeated trials a week apart of this study. Only 40 individuals studied. Again, they were studied starting about an hour and a half after dosing, so hopefully at the time when these drugs were having their robust effects. So many of the tests for executive function are designed to be really simplistic. So you're pushing a button to, when you see a symbol there versus there, or you are doing a maze where you're moving from one to two to three to four across a messy crowded figure. Those are fairly simplistic tests. Many of them are designed to be simple to extract just one variable, but they don't have a lot to do with real life functioning. And this test that they used, which is called the knapsack optimization test. So you're told you have a knapsack. This is on the computer and you have to put different objects in it. And your goal is to fill it to the highest amount without going over the weight threshold. Mathematically, it can be shown this is a much more complicated test. So they argue that it's much more like many of the real world challenges people face, like you 
prioritize or triage or deal with all the tasks you have to do today? How do you get a task done in an environment where there's lots of conflicting demands upon your time? About half the time, whether the person was on the placebo or whether they were on one of the drugs, about half the time they reached the optimal result. Performance in terms of how many times they got the best answer didn't differ. But if you looked at the average test score, all the drug trials, people underperformed how they did on the placebo. So if you just looked at the average of how many items they got into the uh, knapsack, it was less than they got in. And again, you're never allowed to exceed the total weight than they got in with the placebo group. How much time someone spent deciding, should I put in this object next or this into the backpack? And the number of steps someone took was greater on all three of these substances than it was on placebo. But the productivity, or actually the quality of the choices, was inferior. So you might have spent more time thinking about it, but you actually made a lousier choice. It seemed to be more random than the strategy algorithm plotting thinking that was involved when that same individual was on placebo. So there's also what I would call a leveling effect. So people who did worst on the placebo tests, some of them did a little better with the drugs, some tendency towards, I guess, regression towards mean. But overall, individuals, regardless of which of the three drug conditions, again, each of them got all three across different trials of the study separated in time, made you perform worse. And again, the media's jumped on this as saying, yeah, you're making decisions. You may be more motivated. You may be working harder, longer, persevering at your task, but you're performing more stupidly on these tasks with any of these brain-enhancing drugs. My big problem with all these studies, you know, I'm not disputing that they weren't trying to do them carefully and that the individual results, I'm not thinking they faked them or did anything bad there, but I think there's a serious flaw in picking just one dose of a drug and then making blanket claims about it, particularly the finding that 30 milligrams revved people up, but they didn't perform well, all that tells us to me is on our arousal performance curve is that overshot arousal and we're already on the downside getting bad performance. Does that tell us that stimulants aren't going to help people to focus or perform if they don't have ADHD? Absolutely not. It's saying you probably chose a bad dosage for this. We need to do much better studies before we go around making blanket claims that these drugs don't do any good for anyone without ADHD. And again, those claims are being made. Everything we know suggests ADD-ness is on a spectrum of severity. Are we saying that it's only the most severe or only that fully classically meeting at least enough DSM-5 criteria we're going to benefit? And if you have one less criteria or you only have it much of the time rather than most of the time, you're not going to benefit. That seems to me pretty silly. But again, the overall thing highlights if you're taking any of these drugs, whether you have ADHD or not, matching the dosage to your side effects and to your potential benefits is highly important. 